Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, welcome to anybody who's joining us for the first time, and welcome back to everybody who's either in the class or joining us again. This is Food Literacy for All. We're here this week with Anthony Ryan Hatch. I'm going to let Lily introduce him more in just a moment. Um, but first, just a little bit about what we're doing here. Um, a thank you, first of all, to our sponsors. We have a lot of them. Um, it's only thanks to all of these people contributing that we're able to bring in the kinds of speakers that we that we do for this particular series. This is a unique course. It's led by um, a three faculty team of me, Margot Finn, um, Winona Bynum from the Detroit Pol Food Policy Council and Lily Fink Shapiro, um, also from here at U of M in the Sustainable Food Systems Initiative. Um, it's a unique community academic partnership, free and open to the public, as you all know. Um, and also a class that involves, uh, I think it's six different course codes, both graduate students and undergraduate students here at the University of Michigan. So welcome to everybody who's joining us. We, uh, we are delighted to, to bring you this content. Um, as I mentioned, free and open to the public. All of the classes are also filmed. The videos are available at the SFSI the, uh, and Food Literacy for All websites. Um, that's being dropped in the chat. So if you want to check out any videos of previous speakers, they're all there. Um, and thanks for joining us. There's a bunch of ways to engage, even though we're virtual. So there's quotes and discussion on the Miro boards. You can go and uh, drop any notable quotes from today's talk or upvote other people's quotes or um, post questions and, and thoughts there. There's also, if you want to, um, uh, well, there, we'll have poll questions so everybody can participate in the poll questions. It'll be interactive throughout. Um, and there's also, if you want to tweet about what's going on, you can hashtag food literacy for all and at SFSI underscore UM so that you can participate in the conversation with other people who might be tweeting about it as well. There's also the Q&A box at the bottom. So please use that to, in, to enter any questions as the talk goes. So at any point, please drop questions in the Q&A and we will see them at the end when we have time for some actual conversation with Dr. Hatch. Um, and, uh, and do put them in the Q&A, not in the chat because we will better see them there. All right, so I will hand it off to Lily to tell you a little bit more more about our speaker for this evening. Thank you, Margo. I remember a couple of weeks ago when Malika Kini was with us, he said that he thought you should be a radio speaker. And now I can't get that out of my head. I'm, I just see it. <laughs> I see it when you're speaking. So hi, everybody. What an honor tonight to introduce Dr. Anthony Ryan Hatch this evening. And Dr. Hatch is a critical sociologist who studies the intersections of science, technology, and medicine with special emphases on racial, gender, and socioeconomic inequality. He is an associate professor at my alma mater, Wesleyan University in Connecticut. So it's exciting that you're tuning in from Middletown. And there he is the chair, he's a lot of roles there. He's the chair of the Science and Society program. And he's also an affiliated faculty member in the Department of African-American Studies, the College of the Environment and the Department of Sociology. He is the author of two books. One of them that was published in 2019 is called Silent Cells, The Secret Drugging of Captive America. And then another one from 2016 is called Blood Sugar, Racial Pharmacology and Food Justice in Black America. And maybe Dr. Hatch, he might look familiar to you if you watched, there's a recent PBS documentary called Blood Sugar Rising. He's in that. So perhaps you have seen his face there. Um, that one, it's about America's quote, America's hidden diabetes epidemic. And Dr. Hatch, I was reading about you and I can't even keep track of all of the different groups, clubs, clusters, labs, initiatives that you either um, advise or participate in. Um, I'm, I'm impressed with how many, how many things you're involved with. So it's really clear that, it's abundantly clear that you're just deeply immersed with students and activists both on and off campus. And so I really admire and respect that. And Dr. Hatch, thank you so much for being with us this evening at Food Literacy for All. And now I will pass you the virtual mic. Thank you so much, Lily. And it's really lovely to be with all of y'all. Um, it's always very, I blush at, at, the in, at the introductions, but it's nice to document the work. I mean, I am, I have been working and that's certainly evident from, from, from that introduction. So thank you so much. I'm gonna share my screen and everyone can see that that looks good um, but it's really wonderful to be with everyone this evening i'm grateful to all of the students community members and other workers um, who are going to take time to to 
to be in this conversation. A special thank you to the entire team of people who were involved with Food Literacy for All. I, I know I don't know everyone by name, but Lily, Winona, and Marco, especially for their invitation um, to join you today, um, nearly at the end of what has been, I know, a, a rich uh, experience for all of you. I've been so impressed by your organization and structure and the efforts to build like informed and more democratic communities around food and food justice. So today I'm gonna talk about some work in progress that I'm developing in collaboration with students here at Wesleyan in the Black Box Laboratory or otherwise Black Box Labs. Um, and this, by the way, is a logo we just created uh, for this particular project, Metabolism Cages for New World Animals, Small and Large. Um, which I'll share with you today. Um, this project, when it's finished, is going to take several different forms, uh, perhaps some scholarly uh, publications, uh, um, some uh, an art and scientific exhibition, um, in, addition to some, uh, just in addition to some things I'll show you today. Uh, so we're just really getting things going, and it's a really exciting time in a project about kind of halfway through, maybe even beyond halfway through, where you can really begin to see that some of the textures and some of the moments that are going to make this story um, make sense to you. So uh, a quick overview and that beautiful logo again from the this is actually a logo from the archives here at Wesleyan, the archives for Professor Wilbur uh, Olin Atwater, who I'll talk about later, um, who is an alum of Wesleyan and one of its first professors of chemistry. Um, and uh, uh, Atwater was also the dude who was responsible for crowning the imperial calorie. His his work here at, Re at Wesleyan, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, uh, you know, happened in the chemical laboratory. So I took the uh, we took a photo of the original logo, which was on a kind of paper, uh, and uh, uh, tinkering and procreate, you know, erased by dot by dot the the chemical and inserted black box lab to keep that iconography from that original. It's just so cool and fun to play. Um, but um, in this talk, I'm not going to go through each of these 14 points, and there's certainly more in the middle here, but this is just so you can have this for the record. Um, I'm going to, we're going to open the black box of the metabolism cage to unpack the tangle of bodies, nutrients, uh, pharmacopoeia, and knowledge contained within to sort through the interests that shape their institutional arrangements. Now, you don't know what a metabolism cage is. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, and we're also going to talk about uh, a, a framework, really a research project unto itself called metabolic dominance. Um, and this is going to be a way uh, that we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about today, the social structures and processes and institutions that deposit food and pharmacopoeia into our metabolism cages. So we're going to begin the story in 2002. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, otherwise known as DARPA, launched a new military biomodification program called Metabolic Dominance. Its purpose was to create a super soldier whose biochemistry could be manipulated to overcome the biological limits imposed by their environment, such as the need to eat, sleep, breathe. Like Captain America, as shown here in this the Bioneer website, uh, they would no longer be subject to, to the normal metabolic constraints of the human body. Imagine the military implanting microcomputers into soldiers' endocrine glands that could switch the hormonal signals that say eat or stop eating. A soldier could fight for days without having to sleep or hold their breath underwater for much longer than a human being should. It makes sense to me why the US military would be interested in metabolism as a medium for making super soldiers. From, from a biochemical perspective, metabolism encompasses all of the chemical reactions that unfold within the body, processes that allow us to derive energy from food, take oxygen from air, and interact with a whole host of biochemistry that connect us to our environments. This is an extreme form of biopolitics where manipulating how bodies interact with ecologies is the kind of very terrain upon which, uh, the very battleground on and through which metabolic dominance is waged. Metabolic dominance is uh, all about using a wide range of technologies to control and transform 
the biochemistry that creates interdependence between bodies and ecologies. I'll read that one again. Metabolic dominance is all about using a wide range of technologies to control and transform the biochemistry that creates interdependence between bodies and ecologies. And in a broader sense, metabolic dominance really, of course, begins with the system of racial capital established by European and American colonial powers, principally through monocropping, right? Slavery-based agricultural systems, which I'll come back to uh, a little bit later in the talk in a different context. The guy behind metabolic dominance was um, a guy by the name of Michael Goldblatt. Um, and uh, I couldn't find a picture of him. I literally cannot find a picture of this guy. So I give you a not so comforting substitute and that's Ronald McDonald, you see there. Um, Michael Goldblatt was headed up the Defense Sciences Office at DARPA from 1999 to 2003. Um, and yet it was his job in 1990 that drew the attention of the Washington Post who wrote this puff piece about him. It says, meet the McMahon who's in charge of nutrition. Michael Goldblatt uh, was of course appointed as the Chief Science and Technology Officer at McDonald's. Uh, from 1990, he was appointed in 1990, a job he held till 2001. Um, so I wanna, I'll point this out in the next slide, but he, for two years, he had both jobs, both at DARPA heading up this sci defense sciences office and also at McDonald's heading up science and tech development at McDonald's. Um, so in this Washington Post puff piece, Carol Sugarman writes, uh, uh, you know, where Goldblatt, quoting Goldblatt, McDonald's is a company where authority and power go to those who seize it, says Goldblatt. Does he seize it? He hesitates, then jokingly asks that the tape recorder be turned off. I'd like to think I have more power than I probably do, but I think it's fair to say that nobody's ever stopped me, he said. As scary as that is, um, I'd like to point out that this story begins with Goldblatt recalling that as a child, he ate six hamburgers at a stretch, much like the Hamburglar. Um, and so this is a, a version of the uh, 2015 reboot of the Hamburglar uh, in the Time Magazine puff piece about him, where the Hamburglar was now like a sexy suburban kind of white dad, like, you know, uh, <laughs> Um, I prefer the old scary Hamburglar um, that are shown here, um, super scary. Uh, and actually, I was remembering that as a, it, back in the 80s when I grew up, uh, the McDonald's had playlands, these outside play structures, and the, and the, the hamburger was actually like a play, you'd kind of crawl up to the hamburger, and it had bars in it, which will become relevant later. Nonetheless, Sugarman writes about, uh, about Goldblatt as a child and an adult. Michael has been blessed with a rocket metabolism. Indeed. So he was the chief science and technology officer at McDonald's while he was heading up DARPA, as shown in red here. This is from his, uh, one of his, uh, from the website for CSU Ventures, Colorado State University Ventures, where he is one of its, uh, on its advise, scientific advisory board. Um, he's also in the cannabis game, which is inter interpolated into that image, uh, uh, Cision. Uh, he's part of uh, their advisory board as well. Mastering the techniques of metabolic dominance has served Mr. Goldblatt well, both personally and professionally, and his work at DARPA and, metabolic, uh, and at McDonald's has had far-reaching metabolic effects. Metabolic dominance has new consumer-facing applications as well. Here's one, the Nutribox by HVMN, run by this guy, Jeffrey Wu. I'm happy to link you, if you want to, to this not-so-fascinating interview on the Alpha Human podcast, where Mr. Wu talks about achieving metabolic dominance through the nicely packaged $100 a box, $109 for a one-time order of, of Nutribox supplements, which are designed to provide energy and focus, improve memory, protect your brain, body, and improve sleep quality. As you might suspect, there are, of course, carceral applications of these kinds of nutraceuticals. Um, that are often enabled by prepackaging in op-eds uh, in plant story plants like this one in the Chicago Tribune, uh, talking you know, about corrective nutrition, how vitamins for prisoners would save taxpayers money, um, or this one uh, coming out of a uh, this kind of pharmaceutical pharmacopoeia website paid for by by pharmaceutical interests and nutritional supplement interests, Dutch prisoners enrolled in dietary supplement aggression study. 
Um, uh, and again, here the idea is to study if differences in whether you're taking supplements or not makes a difference in terms of controlling behavior um, inside carceral contexts. Meanwhile, out here in so-called free society, metabolic dominance is unfolding via new institutional formations. Now, for example, when you search in Google and you click on Monsanto, the giant C corporation, you now get this. This says Bayer up top, shaping agriculture. So in May 2018, the U.S. Justice Department, U.S. in May 2018, the Justice Department approved what was the largest merger divestiture ever for the unholy union between pharmaceutical giant Bayer and seed monster Monsanto. This is the new corporate environment that's shaping our collective metabolisms. And in the talk that follows, I'm going to talk about metabolic dominance as offering us a new kind of language to talk about the flow of food and pharmacopoeia through not just prisoners' bodies, as suggested by, by uh, this, these studies about nutritional, uh, correct, uh, correct, correctional nutrition, but through um, the entire ecosystem. While the military has been tinkering and trying to tinker with the metabolism of its troops and McDonald's with its billions served, transnational food and pharmaceutical interests have long successfully altered and profited from the transformations of what we might think of as carceral metabolisms. In this context, the carceral state attempts to meet its constitutional obligations to provide proper food and medicine to the citizenry, to the people it holds, but it cannot do this in a weak business environment. So my claim, and the claim that we're, we're building up through this work, is that structures and technologies of carcerality are fundamental to our scientific knowledge about metabolism and its effects. Um, out here in so-called free society, we're embedded in the self-same system as me of metabolic dominance as those held in cages. This is a system we have to name and confront. Yet the litany of metaphors to describe like food injustice and ph pharmaceutical injustice are insufficient to account for the rise of metabolic dominance. I'm sure you talked about this, the food desert concept, right? A food desert is a neighborhood without grocery stores without, or fresh foods near, located nearby, say within a, within a mile or so. And while this concept you know, brought attention to and raised questions about the unequal availability of food in a community, uh, it's been critiqued on various grounds. There's also the food swamp, you know, that we live in a food swamp instead. Now, the swamp is a neighborhood that's full of fast food and, and other junk food, convenience stores and gas stations and such. That's where people eat. There's food around. It's just not good food. So you have to eat kind of from the swamp. But again, this kind of this particular kind of spatial metaphor doesn't capture all sorts of variability, all sorts of social processes regarding how people get food and how the food systems put together. It's a it's an inadequate metaphor. Well, perhaps what about the landfill? Um, you know, in a recent paper, which I'll talk about in just two seconds, I've been thinking about the, the idea of a land for the, the binge uh, as at least one way to think about what's happening with respect to sugar, um, which is something I've been studying for a long time. Um, so, you know, in a paper that I published with two former students, uh, Julia Gordon and Sonia Sternlieb, um, we argued um, in uh, this art, this paper here in Edible Feminisms, this is in the, the Journal of Food Culture and Society 2019, that um, we're living in vast ecologies, kind of sugar ecologies, that are kind of dumping grounds for surplus sugar. And these are kind of social and spatial structures that are particularly harmful for black people. So we're tracing some of their racial and metabolic effects in this, in this piece. Um, sugar ecologies for us were structures of environmental racism that are designed and built to dump a staggering amount of added sugars into people's bodies. And we developed the concept of sugar ecologies in relationship to binging um, uh, in, or as a way to think beyond kind of food deserts and food swamps. Um, and I strongly encourage you to go check out not just our piece in Food Culture and Society, but the whole, there's a whole series, of, uh, this is the good folks at, uh, in the Edible Femini 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 Feminisms Project at UCLA, the Center for Study of Women, um, on waste, discard, and metabolism, just brilliant work throughout this special issue, which I would, would point you all to. So all of these questions I'm going to kind of, this setup I'm going to kind of hold, 
And I'm gonna ask you my first pop quiz question. It's so fun to be your teacher, but to get to not be your teacher, but get to ask you a question. So I'm gonna, this is your first question. It's quiz question number one. Um, and it is, on average, how much additional money per month does a USDA sponsored thrifty food plan market basket bring in for a quote reference family of four in 2021? Is it 258 per month, 525 per month, 837 per month, or 1,003 per month? What do you think that is? Click your, your answer. How much additional money per month? Again, that food, that market basket is like that, bun it, it, this is conceptual theoretical bundle of food that the average family would need not to be healthy and thrive, but to kind of barely get by. Uh, there's a whole history to this food basket, food plan uh, uh, concept that I'm happy to point you to as well. But this is our question. A, B, C, or D? What do you think that is? I'm going to let you guys have a minute to think about that. This actually, as one 10-second uh, um, diversion while you wait and while you, while you answer your questions, my first class in one of my first classes in sociology as an undergraduate at Dartmouth College was a class on food insecurity. Um, and that class was my first class in sociology, and I mean, it's really I've stuck with that with that theme um, on and off over all of these years. All right, all right. Let's see what you got. The thirty percent A, no oh, B twenty five five twenty five C. Okay, the correct answer, my friends, is C. The correct answer is C. Eight hundred and thirty seven dollars per month additionally on average for a reference family of four uh additionally each month to help them buy groceries that's about you know 200 a week once you factor out the 40 to in the gas to get there probably 50 in gas now all right that's number one that's it that's a good question you look up that food that 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 market basket plan um how we feed our in most impoverished citizens so to transition back to this narrative for years um, you know, I've been thinking and writing about the points of contiguity and integration between food and pharmaceutical regimes. Um, how do food and pharmaceutical regimes converge in our society and in different institutional contexts? Which firms and power relations bind these two systems together to form the institutional architecture for metabolic dominance? What other metaphors um, and artifacts can help us get to the bottom of where food and pharmacopoeia converge. Um, and that's going to bring me back to metabolic dominance in the next slide. But again, in Blood Sugar, in my book, Silent Cells, and in, in Ruha Benjamin's brilliant edited volume, Captivating Technology, and my contribution to that, to that edited volume, that is called Billion Served, Prison Food Regimes, Nutritional Punishment, and Gastronomical Resistance, where I'm really trying to understand the food systems that are in place within the U.S., um, carceral system and really kind of put a spotlight on those. I also use this notion of food regime um, to understand um, really pharma pharmaceutical interests uh, in silent cells. So um, we have a bunch of big questions and I'm gonna pose them here. I know I'm not gonna answer these questions today, but I'm gonna raise them for you. And maybe you can start thinking about them um, relative to what you hear next. And they are, how does metabolic dominance unfold? via social structures of race, gender, class, ability, as well as across species, which will become relevant in a minute. How is metabolic dominance engineered via carceral designs and logics? What contexts and contents of knowledge does metabolic dominance produce? And finally, a genealogical question, how are these knowledges reinserted into science, capital, and statecraft in the furtherance of metabolic dominance? These are some big questions, but you know, for one, you know, kind of concept to kind of hold on to this kind of food and pharmaceutical regime. Now, this a regime in this context. These are historically contingent constellations of political and economic structures, rules, contracts, and trade relationships, on the one hand, and techno scientific practices, agricultural industrialization biomedicalization, the scientization of farming, eating, and drugging, that all of which pattern the production and consumption of food and pharmaco pharmacopoeia globally. 
And so here I'm just kind of bringing these two uh, forms of matter together under one theoretical rubric to understand how they move and how they flow um, through the social order. Um, together, these regimes implicate more than just humans and social structures. Also captured in metabolic dominance are plants and non-human animal species on every continent. So like the scholars shown here, I'm interested in tracing how the animal human boundary figures in the design of metabolic dominance and how that boundary co constitutes racial, gender, and class hierarchies along the way. My colleague Megan Glick, with whom I recently co organized a seminar called The Future of Health here at Wesleyan, has written beautifully and powerfully about this boundary, as has Zakia Jackson in her book Becoming Human um, uh, Matter and Meaning in an Anti Black World. Um, leading animal studies scholar and my dear colleague here at Wesleyan, Lori Gruen, um, uh, her new book with Justin Marceau, uh, Carceral Logics, Human Incarceration and Anim Animal Captivity, gets right to the heart of the matter. This book isn't out yet, uh, but it's one that is coming out. And as the talk proceeds, um, you'll begin to understand how important these ideas will be for us as we sort through our work and as you understand what we're talking about. Um, so before I go to the next, next, uh, so all the theory part is over, I have one more question for you. And this is a preview for the next slide, but during what historical period do you think that the food calorie was discovered? During what historical period was the food calorie discovered? Was it in the 1830s to 1850s? The 1880s to the 1900? Was it in that period? Was it in 1910 to 1930? Or in the World War II period, 1940 to 1950. When was the food calorie discovered? Yeah, what do you think about that? And this is, this is of course, a reference back to uh, um, earlier in the talk, and I won't, I won't give any more clues. That I, don't, I want you to have a, a, good, a good chance to answer this one right. All right. During what period was the food calorie? Of course, the calorie is like the amount of energy that's released when you eat the food. <laughs> Right, so I'm drinking a cup of green tea right now. No calories in this green tea. But I'm certainly burning calories sitting here. Um, not enough, apparently, according to my blood sugar. Here, let me mute this alarm before I, that alarm is on us. All right. I'm um, looking at your distributions. Um, dear friends, the correct answer is B. It is B. Uh, Wilbur Olin Atwater, whose work we'll talk about in our next slide, um, was responsible for some, much of the important work on the food calorie uh, here actually at Wesleyan. So we'll talk about that here in our next slide. Very good. That's the last hard question. The last, the next, the last one is fun. So um, Wilbur Atwater um, in, the, in 19, 1892 began work on building what was called a respiration calorimeter. This is a kind of metabolism cage. And uh, this is a photo of that first calorimeter in the basement of Fisk Hall here on, at, on Wesleyan's campus. Um, and uh, you can see here in, on the front side of this structure, there's a little glass window. A human being would go in there, would get in this box. And then from inside this box, uh, they were, as you see, all these tubes and wires feeding in and out of this box. They were controlling precisely the flow of oxygen in, in and out, CO2 in and out. They precisely monitored the temperature of the human subject inside. Uh, they precisely monitored and controlled the food that was going in. Uh, they fed people. So people, I'll talk about this in the next slide, but they built this machine that would allow you to, to discover, to discover the value, the, the value of a calorie. And this, this respiration calorimeter was the technology, the apparatus used to come up with this. It was so good, in fact, that after Atwater built one at Wesleyan, um, he was uh, brought in to work at the USDA as its first research scientist. And he established the first kind of environmental uh, um, nutritional agricultural research station here at Wesleyan in that period. But he went on to build a calorimeter at, in Washington, D.C. Uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the subsequent period, there was also a, uh, a Carnegie, the Carnegie Foundation um, also built one at Harvard, which we're, we're also tracking down. Um, 
But this is the first metabolism cage I want to show you. And again, I'm going to talk more about these structures in a minute. But um, again, the idea was to track the income and outgo, the flow, in and out, what comes in and what goes out. And through that movement, you can produce all sorts of interesting knowledges that could then be used in all sorts of contexts. So, of course, the calorie otherwise known as the imperial calorie, was used to establish nutritional and agricultural regimes all over the world. Uh, subsequently, that's the regime we're still kind of in vis-a-vis uh, -vis the calorie. Um, um, in that same period, right before they, they finished the work on the first calorimeter, um, Atwater spent time at Tuskegee and down near Auburn. Um, and he was interested in working with Booker T. Washington on the question of Negro food and the question of the kind of the social, the Negro problem, as he framed it, of course, the race problem, again, as Du Bois in this period was fam would famously write about. And, and Atwater writing, you know, says the Negro problem, like many other sociological problems, represents a disorder in the body politic and a correct diagnosis of the case is needed before we prescribe a proper remedy. The knowledge of the underlying facts is not revealed by political discussion any more than a cure can be found in mere legislation. So it obviously needed a scientific solution. And the food of the Negro for Atwater in the South is one-sided and ill-balanced. It contains relatively little of the materials which make blood and muscle and brain, and a relatively large amount of those which supply the body with its heat and keep it warm and muscular strength for its work. Considering the body as a machine, as of course Atwater did, the food of the Negro lacks material for building and repair and contains an, a relative excess of fuel. Um, there's an just amazing work that, that, that um, Atwater did at, at, at Tuskegee. This, by the way, is a photo uh, taken that, during their, one of their site visits of this beautiful home made by one of the carpenters who worked at Tuskegee. Uh, just this beautiful structure. This is also paired with structure, uh, images of structures that were not so beautiful and much more ramshackle. We're also tracking um, some of Atwater's work that may have been done and contracted inside state institutions, other kinds of confinement settings during the same period, um, you know, subsequent to this in the early 19 teens and 20s. Um, and so again, this is just from just one little clip from his archive that we're, we're tracing down in order to establish a thoroughly satisfactory dietary standard. It's going to be necessary to do two things, he said. One is to make actual feeding experiments with people of different classes in order to find just what kinds of and amounts of food and of nutritive ingredients are really best adapted to their needs. Such experiments can be carried out in public institutions without discomfort or disadvantage, whatever, to the inmates. They will indeed be somewhat costly. Uh, I think it best to manage the enterprise would be, uh, I think the best way to manage the enterprise would be to go about it rather slowly and gradually, training a number of competent men and women to conduct experiments while the results are carefully watched. In this way, it'd be possible to find what no, otherwise no physiologist can tell us as to what are the proper physiological standards, that is, what materials best meet the actual demands of people of different classes, men and women and children and health and in different forms of disease and so forth. So we're, we're interested in tracking to see what he actually did inside those institutions and r really inside carceral settings um, much earlier than I had understood that work to be happening. Um, just another couple of schematic designs, and this is one schematic design of the, of the respiration calorimeter um, as it was built at Wesleyan. This is an artist's rendering of that same structure uh, um, put in, the yearly, in a yearbook for the USDA. This is some sketch work that I did uh, tracing out some of these images because we're going to eventually build one uh, for an exhibition. We're going to build a, a, a respiration calorimeter, an artistic one at least, uh, next year. And so we're, we're kind of beginning to, to get that mapped out and laid out um, for the work. One of the fascinating things about this, of course, was that it took a whole team of people to operate this apparatus. 16 people had to be present to run the calorimeter. Um, according to Atwater, all the experiments have been made with active men in good health. Of course, that is normal subjects, um, which were mostly Wesleyan students and laboratory assistants from local Middletown. Um, experiments ran from a few hours uh, long to 10 plus consecutive days inside the, the, the calorimeter. 
most of them were two to four days. And interestingly, there was a telephone inside for communication because obviously they had to keep this thing sealed. So they could see you, you could talk, but you stayed in there. Um, and again, uh, this one of the things they put inside for some of the experience was a, a bicycle ergonometer where you could precisely measure how much energy was exerted when you pedal the pedals on the bike. Uh, that was part of the, uh, the regime that would produce these kinds of muscular exercises down there on the bottom. You've seen that bottom right. Average amount of output of carbon dioxide and heat from the body. And then you can see how you can compute the calories from that. These were what Atwater called the fundamental laws of normal nutrition. Um, all right. Uh, there's these wonderful images. This is just a, a slide to show you of these were taken inside the USDA calorimeter uh, in Washington, um, where they had subjects kind of doing like routine, like routine everyday activities. Um, you have this woman in this kind of sailor suit um, ironing, um, and you have this dis fine distinguished gentleman, um, you know, doing his lettering and eating his lunch. Um, you know, uh, there in the calorimeter, everything was again precisely measured, monitored, and these kind of social activities. Now we're interested in tracking out, for example, you know, what what compelled them to have, for example, the women doing the ironing and the men kind of studying their letters. Uh, we're obviously looking at the gender relations that were playing out here, including how they came up with the kind of scripts and staging for some of these these renditions. Um, I'm very curious in, in that, especially relative to the work that Atwater had been doing at Tuskegee and what he kind of saw there, people doing in their structures uh, um, in which they were living out their lives. There was a big calorimeter. There was a little one that was made after that. Uh, and this is you know shown in 1916 um, for the first time. And it's back there on the panel on the left is that little box A is the little tiny calorimeter. And you could put all sorts of things in it. There's a picture of them putting bananas in it. And you would put the food in it and you measure what happens. And you can produce all of these enormously um, technical reams of data about what food does and what happens to the body when food passes through it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is an interesting form of metabolic cage. Um, but there's another metabolism cage I want to talk about in this part of the talk. And in her 2007 book, Medical Apartheid, the noted historian Harriet Washington recounts the horrors of Dr. William Abbott, shown here, a gastroenterologist who intubated black men, his animals, with 12 foot long rubber tubing um, and subjected them to x-ray uh, to study intestinal disorders. Now, Abbott was responsible with his partner Miller for the Abbott Miller Abbott tube shown here, which actually you know, is a, there's a little balloon on the end, and you could you know, uh, siphon that through the esophagus down into the into the system, uh, into your GI system to see what's going on. Um, nonetheless, Abbott, you know, called his his black men his animals, um, and what, at one point he had a, a, a he needed to. Uh, Run a, run a scan on a subject who had a bullet lodged in his in his body, leading Abbott to remark, such events led me at times to wish that I could keep my animals in metabolism cages. And when I read this, this quote in Washington, it's really what sparked this whole project. I didn't know what metabolism cages were. Um, and I was interested in some of their history. That's why go, we go back to Atwater and we're going to go some other places as well. Um, but not just what metabolism cages were, but the relationship between race, animality, domination, medical progress that was embedded within this, this confinement structure that he had referenced in 1935. I still don't know like what kind of structure he used actually in terms of its material design at that time, but um, I do know uh, a little bit, you know, kind of later what things looked like um, just a couple decades later. So the very next image I can I can find for we we have found we're again we're trying to fill in a huge timeline of design. It's from 1963, where a simple inexpensive metabolism cage would be used for small mammals here, right? Pfeffer and Goss. Um, this will is an image of a Nalgene metabolism cage for a small rodent, usually um, that uh, retails used on eBay for about $500. Again, this is made of Nalgene. Um, and um, 
So again, this is 1963. This is a, a more, much more contemporary version, but still kind of non-electronic. And then there's like whole new things. Um, there's the Promethean, um, which is the ultimate metabolic behavioral measurement system. And inside this giant refrigerator thing you see here, each of those little boxes is a little metabolism cage. And there'd be a little mouse, a genetically engineered mouse or rodent, bunny, rabbit, pig living in there. And all of their um movements in and out all the intro and outro is precisely monitored and fed into this big uh block database thing here um yeah metabolism cages have a history and that's kind of what we're interested in tracing uh, in this project they emerged as key experimental infrastructures in animal studies they were used to design to capture control and isolate the metabolic processes unfolding within a subject's body by placing new world animals, both small and large, in the cage, and by precisely controlling their food and water intake and monitoring and analyzing their bio waste, researchers can calculate the metabolic rates of various, of various kinds and develop a whole new set of powerful knowledges about how bodies and environments interact, specifically food environments. Metabolism cages are meant to mimic specialized operating environments that allow nutrients to flow through bodies, a movement of matter that creates effects, institutionalized effects, structural effects, pattern effects. Metabolism cages facilitate the measurement of the biological effects of scientized and industrialized living on organisms. As a techno-scientific object, metabolism cages allow researchers to open the black box of metabolism by capturing animals in metabolism cages. The scientific constraints on a metabolic dominance can be freed. You can just kind of, we can do all sorts of things now that we know that we have the ultimate, you know, system as, as shown here in, Promethea, in the Promethean. Um, so drawing on key insights from STS and animal studies, our project is exploring the racial history of metabolism cages as carceral and experimental technologies that became part of, really instrumental to, a much broader scheme to establish metabolic dominance over multi-species life. So I have one final question for you, and this one's fun, and then we're kind of rounding into the last part of the talk. We're almost, we're almost there. You guys are doing great. And this is question, you know, how hard is it to find recent, within the last five years, and reliable estimates on how many animals are used in scientific and biomedical experiments each year in the United States? What about globally? A, it's as easy as a piece of warm cherry pie, sounds so good. B, not that hard at all, but I had to scan more than two websites. C, hard, but I would do it again if you paid me a hundred bucks. Or D, um, hold please, I'm still, I'm still looking. How hard do you think it is to find recent data on how many animals are actually confined in various kinds of structures, metabolism cages in the US globally right now? Curious what you think, is it A, super easy, B, mm, C, hard, or D, <laughs> what do you think? Still looking, it should, say, it should say still looking, it's missing the NG there, still looking, hold please. Still, still looking. All right, just a couple more seconds there. This is obviously there's no, 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 no one answer that's correct except for the one that is correct. I'm curious what you think it is. All right, let's see what the results. Oh, okay, there's a spread. Four percent of you said it's super duper easy, and you probably tried to Google trying to find some, uh, some. You know, you're on page one of the Google results and you found something. Maybe B. Okay, I, I had a hard time finding really, really good recent data in places I think should have that data. For example, the NIH, the National Science Foundation, those are, aren't places where you can readily find this information. Um, and so I would say, just as my, for my part, that the answer is still is D, still looking, still looking. Um, and maybe if I you know, find an answer, I'll circle one back to you guys in the next couple of weeks. So I want to round out uh, to talk more about these these cages and show you some problems um, and some some challenges. Um, um, first, this is an article published in 1974 by Richard Herbert. Are we good? We're good. We're good. Uh, Richard Herbert, where he's describing some of the problems of of designing and using cages for New World primates, and this.
this is where I got it caught the title for this project from this piece. Um, um, he says that meta metabolic studies using are time consuming and expensive and unless considerable care can be taken the systematic errors that can easily be so large that the results are meaningless right the main sources of error in in studies using metabolism cages were associated with the method of caging and the nature of the diet so in this article herbert lays out here's a picture of this kind of eight structure unit he has in his lab this is at the zoological society of london he lays out the various chemical compositions of the food that would be the pellet preparations, uh, how literally down to the hundredth of a of a decimeter, what uh, uh, the hundredth place, um, what would what would go in it. Um, there was just wonderful, uh, wonderfully tragic, I should say, accounts in Herbert's article about the monkeys and all of the error that they would introduce into the regime too. He said. Um, primates are particularly difficult to house and control as they are often sufficiently intelligent to be deliberately destructive, end quote. That's what he said. Primates are particularly difficult to house and control. They are often sufficiently intelligent to be deliberately destructive. Um, in the 1990s, um, there's been some of the research on the effects of pregnant rats, uh, on what it meant to live in a, preg in a metabolism cage for a pregnant rat, and the maternal and developmental effects on offspring living in these structures. Um, uh, it's not good, right? There was a moderate increase in the number of skeletal defects. Um, an important implication of this work would be that pregnant animals should not be housed in these cages. This is 1994. Um, so instead of housing them one by one, maybe we can, in, in, you know, we can do things to replace animals in these settings. We can refine how we do that and provide them more interaction, or we can reduce them wholesale. So this uh, article from 2021 um, describes like basically apartments, a group housing approach for non-human primate metabolism studies, where they put, um, you know, more than one uh, uh, new world primate um, <laughs> into these structures and, and make it better because they've got each other. What about dogs? They do this. There's a recent study also looking at dogs in the same way, 2020, right? Moving from on your left, a single dog per cage to a multiple dog per cage where they can like touch noses. There's a hatch between the two cages where they, the two dogs can, can touch. And that's a novel welfare and a scientific approach because the science is what's important. In black box labs, and this is where I'm gonna spend the last literally couple of minutes on of my talk, we are designing not just um, a calorimeter for next year, but we're gonna build in the next few weeks um, a dollhouse um, shown here on the right um, of an, a kind of metabolism cage, but inside the dollhouse, it's going to be a three tiered, um, structure with a prison kitchen, a prison cell, and a prison pharmacy. And we're going to use all sorts of lights and LEDs and flows to show, illustrate movement of materials and matter through this structure um, as a kind of creative and political science demonstration and art project. Um, we're working on this like literally right now. We just met Monday to ho hopefully put together materials lists. This is the first um, uh, uh, animation that we put together um, uh, to describe what this process is like. Again, drawing on that analogy and example where we put like a little bed and we put a little toilet in there and we have the food and the band-aids and the rotten onions and the cheese, you know, co coming into the top, into the feeder and then coming out. We actually, you know, made the point that there's a lot of money coming out of there as well. So this is all about uh, finding different ways to visualize and represent these practices in a way that is compelling, um, not just in terms of telling the history of these design structures, but also telling the sociological story about power. That's really central to to the way I, to the way that we are seeing this. Um, lastly, um, you know, uh, this is again another quote from Herbert, um, and here we position two images side by side, two diagrams side by side. One, a metabolism cage for a new world animal, and then small, and then one large. 
here drawing on the precise schematic diagrams for a standard U.S. prison cell, right? It was important that the cage system should not take up a lot of space, but that the animals should have a reasonable amount of room, Herbert wrote. The processes of metabolic domination grew very neatly with structures of racism, sexism, capitalism, ableism, nationalism, and multi-species mass incarceration. In this talk, I hoped to just kind of spark and open up some thinking about what might be anti-racist or anti-capitalist or abolitionist responses to metabolic dominance. Breaking free of metabolism cages and bringing about regime change that can upend metabolic dominance will take nothing less than a major decolonization and a redesign of not just global agriculture, right, um, but metabolic science and social medicine. We must continue to grapple with the central questions facing different species living under these metabolic dominance relations and in these variously designed metabolism cages, both small and large. So with that, I want to thank you for your patience and offer you peace. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can engage in some q and I'm going to take a sip of my tea and welcome back, Hi, Winona. Hello. Oh, that, that was great. Um, you know, one thing I love about these, um, I loved when I heard about your information and about all these talks are the ties and how interrelated the food system is to so many things and the origins that there are um, with things we take for granted. We look right. around and we think things have always been this way and we don't really think about their origins. So thank you for that. Um, really great. Uh, just to jump off, I'll, I'll get started with the yeah. Q&A. Their, their Q&A is filling up. <laughs> so um, the first question. Haley, uh, Haley says, given all of this information you've uncovered, do you have a professional value judgment or given or even a personal opinion to make on metabolism cages, specifically in terms of housing, rodents or dogs in the name of scientific advancement? Or is taking a stance not good, not the goal of your research? Taking a stance is 1000% a, a goal of this research to try to identify and critique directly the people, institutions, processes that are involved in, 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 in dominations of various kinds and to not pull any punches when it comes to that. This is just me speaking both, both professionally and personally. I see that, that my ethical commitment to um, to building a just world is I take that very seriously and that that permeates through not just my teaching and my um, administrative work working with others to build institutions that care for people and that more nurture and that but also to be as exacting as I can be in the the, the stories I tell about that past uh, the for, the metabolism cages work again is, is a bit as a it's it's we're about maybe 60 percent of the way through halfway through but um, rest assured, my goal is to find a picture of Michael Goldblatt to understand a little bit better what they were up to at DARPA, to understand better what Wilbur Atwater was doing with Booker T. Washington at, at Tuskegee, um, and to really to draw attention to not just the racial and colonial, but also the gender relations that are implicated in this too. I mean, those, to me, those are all you know, involve and invite a critique of power that um, every project that I do, I don't know how to not really do, I don't know how to do a project that doesn't focus on that. I'm try, I've tried a couple of times, it didn't really work. Um, so yeah, it's absolutely about, you know, naming names and coming for them. Oh, I love it. Let me ask you, you mentioned uh, abolitionist response to metabolism cage. What do you think uh, an abolitionist response would look like? This is, this is a good question. And I have to say that my colleagues in animal studies and who have been working for different forms of work, you know, animal liberation, non-human animal liberation, this is my first kind of 
I've been, I've colleagues and friends with all kinds of folks in this area, but like it's my first serious kind of consideration of the ways in which human mass incarceration, which I have studied carefully, is modeled after practices that were actually perfected on the confinement of other species. And so seeing the connection between those two is brand, is not just new for me, it's definitely an enlightened, I've been enlightened to that connection. And now I'm beginning to see it in all sorts of ways. Um, so an abolitionist response to the metabolism cage would be to, at first, I mean, I still don't even know how many creatures are in these things. Right. Right. So I mean, we know how many people, how many humans are in these cages, because the prison is a big metabolism cage. Right. <laughs> it's just a huge one. Right, really, really big, the same exact design flow, same exact design, uh, but just social, right? Like for the group, the group housing for the multiple primates, it's just, it's just that writ large. So, you know, if we're committed to prison abolition for human beings, it seemed as an ethical and moral stance, um, I'm just, I realize I have to be open to and really think carefully about what it also means to try to identify the structures of confinement that, you know, that don't, I mean, this is what's interesting is that the, that the, and this is a scientific issue, but holding animals in these cages actually makes bad science, right? So it, it, you actually don't get to see what, how animals act in their real environments because you're putting them in artificial environments. <laughs> and so not only that, but they haven't been able to design them in such a way as to be able to get like the kinds of gains that come, they're always promised, but never delivered. And so I'm just interested in tracking that problem about with respect to this case um, and letting the casework guide me and, and let it, the casework guide, guide us as we try to um, create a public, the accessible and clear project that people can understand and see that connection. Oh yeah, this is connected to, you know, the, con the confinement of people is connected to the confinement of these other, other systems, literally at, in terms of how they're designed um, and which is just, you know, that's new, for, that's new for me. Thank you. Okay, so there was a follow-up question and this might even, she might even be a better question. She was, she asked, what do you see? And I think you kind of touched on this in your last response, but what do you see as the best alternative for scientific advancement if we don't do animal testing or use metabolic cages? Oh goodness, I, I don't know the answer to this question yet. Um, but it is one of the principles of that that animal researchers and pharmaceutical researchers and others are trying to themselves implement through replacement. They don't they don't want to keep animals. The argument is we don't want to keep animals in cages, but we kind of have to. So until we come up with a proxy that does what we need it to do other than animals, we're kind of stuck with animals. Um, they made similar arguments for pharmaceutical experimentations in prisons, uh, by, by the way, uh, with humans. And I document this in Silent Cells. Well, if we don't, if we don't experiment on them, we're gonna, it's gonna halt progress. Uh, this very identical argument was made in the 1960s when there were threats to kind of forbid pharmaceutical companies from doing research on prisons. Once that was forbidden, those pharmaceutical companies just went to the third world and started experimenting on people elsewhere. So it, you know, um, um, uh, you know, as a scientific matter, I think it's worth investigating. Well, what are the alternatives re really? Um, but I don't, you know, I, it, it's, 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 yeah, that's what I would say. I don't, I don't know the answer to this question yet, but I, it's part of the frame of what we're interested in. Yeah, that's, that's so difficult. It's like, you see, I don't know, I don't want to call it progress, but some of the discoveries, but they came about in such uh <laughs> right you know right. Like, you know. and you don't know what and you that's the i think the thing for me with the whole black box metaphor is you just don't know what they did you don't know what they did to arrive at the thing and so we should probably know what they did right i i don't subscribe to a means ends form of rationality that in which whatever end we get is just if whatever means we use to get there is always justified because we got there right. i don't think that's true and I think that, that those means ends relate really, that form of domination has been used to justify all kinds of dominations. That kind of just justification has been used to, to justify all sorts of dominations. And I don't I don't think we should accept that. And yet, you know, I can, at least in terms of say pharmaceutical development, you know, there are probably questions, there are certainly technical questions to be asked and answered 
with respect to what pharmaceutical interests want to do and whether they can do it without animals. But I don't conflate the interests of corporations and, and states with the interests of the people. And I think that's, that's maybe an important question to answer. Like, I don't necessarily assume that everything that they're up to is in our best interest, because uh, a lot of the things they do are not in our best interest. And this, so, um, you know, yes, if we want to continue pharmaceutical experimentation along the same track that we've been on, then and business business as usual, well, then, yeah, you got to you got to cut corners ethically to do that. Well, if we don't want to cut corners ethically anymore, what does what do we do then? And if we don't need y'all to make be the most profitable, one of the most profitable industries in capital, you know, and you could be less profitable, then maybe we could do that, too. Good. I, I love that. It's the, it brings up so many questions like you could keep going. I can see imagine with this project that you can just keep going deeper and deeper. It's so, yeah. Uh, when you, like I said, when I first heard the subject, it was just something that I hadn't personally really thought about. <laughs> no, me neither. Me neither. And what's tragic about that, and I know there's other questions, but I had written my book, Blood Sugar, about metabolism, right? And I realized in writing that book and doing my which was my dissertation, and then writing it afterwards that there was a whole world of things I didn't know. Like you know, I was only able to capture just like a little pinprick of a of a huge, almost like a mustard seed of a social world in that one case. And so I think this is a challenge for social researchers generally, is how to properly set the scope conditions for your work. And yes, this metabolism cages project is it spins out in all kinds of directions. And so figuring out how to both raise questions that allow you to kind of pull it in, but also um, in working with students, it's kind of great because we can we can follow all sorts of threads and just see what it, see what see what we find without a need for an, an end product. And it's it's like one of those things that once you see it, you can't unsee it. <laughs> Once I once I saw that they had the apartments, I, I'll I'll just be candid with y'all. Like you know, 170 and eight of 80 of us. It, it, once I saw the the dog, and and the and the apartment cages, I'm like, okay, wait a minute. Now this is, this is, this isn't a solution <laughs> for, for this problem. <laughs> um, and it's just a cure. It you know, it's it raises the question for me of what kinds of questions get raised in science. Like whose question is this? <laughs> you know what I mean? Who needs who needs this answer such that we have to go through this to get the answer? I don't think we. Yeah, I, I just it's a perplexing thing to me. It is, but it, it yeah, there's a lot to think about. I mean, you could yeah. <laughs> um, the question and this next question um, says, how much of the work can now be done by computer computer modeling or other su substitutes? That and that in 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 some of the work that my tracing out of what's been what's happening now. So like a part of my interest is historical. Part of it is trying to get some sense of what's happening in the in the in the now moment. Which again is our our most of our work thus far has been historical, but we are interested in bringing this to the present. So there's a ton of stuff happening now, and it's a world that I don't again need to learn more about. But computer modeling is being used. Um, uh, um, cloned tissues are being used. <laughs> um, there's all sorts of, of technological fixes to this problem of needing biological material uh, to do experimentation. You have to, to I mean, uh, you know, I, I think that this, this question is a good one. And it's one that I mean, whoever the questioner is like reach out to me like in July, because I'm really interested. I mean, I, I need to kind of quickly figure out with my team, you know, what, you know, the abolitionist response, what what does what would it mean to no longer do this kind of caging? Mm -hmm. And what are those what are those alternatives? I, I don't I don't I don't particularly like I don't I, I do want to caution my answer in, in one respect, though. I don't I don't want to lay things. I'm trying to do a project that doesn't always tee things up for power so easily. If you do a critique of power and then lay out the options, you're putting everything on the menu. And I feel like I don't really have as many prescriptive answers as I might like to have for what we might do. But this is more a diagnostic project, I think, for me, where we're trying to like look at this design problem and the sociological problem, figure out what its scope is and what how how it connects to other forms of carcerality. 
Um, and I mean, this is true from both by Blood Sugar and for Silent Cells. Like I'm a professor, I'm a teacher. I'm not, I am not an activist as such. I'm just, my job is here at the university and you know, writing books and, doing, and teaching people. And so I see myself as producing scholarship that in the hands of those activists, in the hands of those freedom fighters out there in the street, use this, here, here's this, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why I wrote Silent Cells, like I, you know, to undermine mass incarceration and how pharmaceutialization upholds mass incarceration. Here's an is a text that is, informs the abolitionist argument. It's not like openly all abolitionists. It's just like, you, this is a piece that holds the system up. Mm -hmm. So go for this piece. And so for, I think for, meta for metabolic cages, it's just, for the metabolism cages, it's the same thing. My concern is not the metabolism cages, it's metabolic dominance. The cages are, are the technology that's used to produce the knowledge needed to make the system. But I'm, it's the system that I'm interested in, vis-a-vis -vis its relationship to the knowledge, but that's it, right? Um, I mean, the animals that are held in cages uh, are also animals that eat the food, like they also eat the food made by, like out here in free society, you know, my cat. <laughs> he's, the, he's that cat food made by these same self same systems built on the calorie built on nutritionism built on carcerality yeah 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 <laughs> yeah you really i think you probably have everybody in the audience thinking <laughs> about and and that's that's the thing that so and even like with this course, the reason that is an academic community partnership is because right. those pieces work together, right? Um, Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, that, that, I, which is, again, why I was so grateful to be part of the conversation and to just share, you know, to share my thoughts and share my two cents. Okay. I love that. Okay. Let me get to some more questions. <laughs> How is this similar and yet different? to confine animal feeding operations or concentrated animal feeding operations. Uh, also, would you include military or armed forces to be a looser form of metabolic do dominance? Um, so the two great questions. I mean, the, the CAFO, um, these concentrated feedlot operations, um, certainly on the design and materials end, the caging and confinement structures that are used to quarantine and isolate and, and contain a bazillion animals across the country for human consumption for, and for, for food um, for both humans and non-human other animals is, is, is big. The difference though, at least one difference I'd highlight that comes to mind is that it, the metabolism cage is does the best ones now are closed systems like like their calorimeter was like it was closed they had to control the outside influences to be able to really isolate the body of the subject inside and see so that what we put in is, and what comes out like we know precisely what you ate how much of it how much of it turned to poop how much of it turned to pee where it went you know um we had to design the cage so they, actually for the monkeys they had to design the cages so the monkeys couldn't eat their own shit. Mm. Right, and so because that was messed right, up the put experiment. It back, put it back it messed up the experiment. <laughs> right, exactly. And what it, what was concerning about it was that it was producing error. It was producing measurement problems for their experiments. So the experiments weren't working right if the animals didn't like stay in their little spot and eat what they were supposed to eat and not move. Um, hence, their long term their long term confinement. Um, whereas on the in the feedlot. The purpose of the confinement isn't to produce knowledge, it's to produce a large, fleshy, cheap, you know, source of animal protein. Right. So the there are epistemic knowledge, things learned by keeping animals in CAFOs for sure. There are knowledges that derive from that, but the, their purpose is not as instrumental to basic science as is the case for metabolism cages, where without, without those confinement structures, you don't get a science of nutrition. You don't have a, a modern science of nutrition without these structures. You don't get to it. That's what Atwater did. They literally, these are them. So th those are really important, but very much connected to that. The other question was about the military. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I know that the military, you know, implemented 
discoveries coming out of the DARPA project, the meta the metabolic domination project. Um, at one point, um, with a, uh, a few years ago, with a food studies scholar, um, Katie Gillespie and I were dreamed of writing a book on on institutionalized food. Um, I, in you know, then the pandemic happened. And other things kind of got in the way, but I was very interested in the in the role of the military in in designing food and food systems, both the military, but also the military vis-a-vis -vis the space program. Uh, they they designed a whole bunch of food technologies that were super interesting and, and then were deployed out here in, in so-called free society, but they had carceral or at least military um, origins. That's interesting. Interesting to think about. And and just like even, yeah, the difference with the KFOs, but you can't have one with the other. And even like you said, our modern as a dietitian, you you're blowing my mind again. <laughs> just thinking about <laughs> Thinking about that, so many of the origins of, of our food system and the way we talk about health and nutrition, um, yeah, the origins of it. So there was another question. Curious to know about how your study of blood sugar and diabetes, how they align or intersect with the study of these metabolic cages. So they, they, they align very directly for me. Um, and, and in this way, um, you know, metabolic syndrome, in, in my book, Blood Sugar, um, I analyze what's called metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is this kind of biomedical idea. Uh, it's not really a disease, but you can think of it as like a syndrome. It's a collection of findings in one body that if, there, if you have a couple of these things, these risk factors for heart disease or stroke at one time, in one body, like you have double. So if you if you're overweight, hypertensive, hyperglyce hyperglycemic, high info levels of inflammation, you have, you know multiple at one time, your risk can be double for heart attack or stroke. And so metabolic syndrome is a term used to define that kind of clustering of risk. Um, the 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 ways in which um, the metabolism cage, caging from the calorimeter and Atwater's work, again, Atwater discovered the calorie, the calorie, the, the food calorie, mm -hmm. um, which was instrumental for implementing all sorts of nutritional programs, agricultural programs around the world. The food system we have inherited is the child of the system Atwater birthed with his, with his, his knowledge um, and, and, and others as well. I mean, he was just one figure in a huge but a very important figure in this in this history, um, the way of reducing the a complex social problem, a complex social process into like a number, right? Complexity into and reducing it down into something that can be understood very simply. Mm -hmm. This is in part what happens with the metabolism cage, right? A very complex organismic process whereby individual organisms are interacting with a litany, we don't even really know all the ways in which we interact with our environments as this open system. Yet, this, this effort to reduce complexity into this kind of numerical schema, into an epistemic schema that was scientific, it was about science, not about the social, not about the political or the cultural. Right. So, um, you know, metabolic syndrome is the same kind of thing for me, right? Metabolic syndrome is not a thing people have. It's more a condition of the social order, right. right? We live in a society that's characterized by endemic, chronic metabolic health problems, right? You know, diabetes is is widely prevalent. It's not an epidemic. Now we see what a pandemic is. This is the, the diabetes epidemic is not an epidemic at all. It's an endemic. It's just generally pervasive, mm -hmm. and so reducing that complexity into, you know, for example, a hemoglobin HB, HbA1c score or what my blood sugar is right now, which is too high for this talk, um, <laughs> um, is, is too reductive. And it doesn't help people understand what to do. And this is, I mean, if I can just make one, like just point about metabolic syndrome, you know, um, and it's not a thing people should be diagnosed with. It's a, but, but it is something that we should be using to understand the convergence of these forces that create, you know, metabolic crises for all of us, and they do create them for all of us, whether we're diabetic or not. Um, 
And so, um, yeah, I could I could talk. I, I actually see this metabolism cages work, bringing together my work in blood sugar and my work in silent cells together in a way I did not anticipate, not in the least bit, not even six months ago. Like it's a it's a really a new a new way of thinking for me. Okay. Yeah. And they, I think they are. There was one more question, but we have the slide up letting us know we should probably wrap it up. Um, oh, I see it. It's from yeah. Business and Price. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Um, so I guess what I would ask you, I was going to ask you about your, your thoughts on the calorie as a, a measure, but I'm going to leave it there. Is there anything else you would want us to take away? <laughs> I mean, I... Again, I'm grateful for the chance to share some of this work with you all. And I realize that sometimes it's challenging to see how these really big, complex social systems come together in ways that we don't, we typically take for granted the food and the medicine. We both need that. That's what the, the dead, my lead in song was Dead Prez, right? Be healthy. Let the food be your medicine. No, et cetera. And they say, let your food be your medicine. And when thinking about food and medicines together as these forms of matter made by others, we don't control those systems. Those systems are again food sovereignty. We don't own no, we don't have food or drug sovereignty. <laughs> we don't own or control any of those systems. That we the, the people don't control any of that. So we have to trust and rely on these folks for the food and the medicine. And we we should better understand how they come up with the things that they come up with. Um, because the the ways in which they come up with them, they've used them to contain us. And that to me is a is a is a is a key insight from this from this new work. Um, so that's what I'd leave you with. Okay, well, thank you. I think that's a good place to leave it. And I am throwing it to Margo now, or Mar Margo, is it Margo or Lily gonna <laughs> take it? I can, I, I'll, I'll wrap us up. Thank you so thank much. You. Just fascinating, um, as you can tell from all the, the wonderful questions. And thank you guys for those questions. Okay, so next week is gonna be a really different format. It's called Fast Food for Thought. And usually we have this event in the fall. It got a bit interrupted from the pandemic. But basically we have, you know, we have over 70 affiliated faculty across campus who study, research, teach about food systems from all different angles. And we're bringing in 10 of them to give just a really bite-sized five minute talk um, about their work. And so we have faculty from um, the Ross School of Business, from Ecology, Evolutionary Biology, from Urban Planning, Engineering, the Botanical Gardens, School for Environment and Sustainability, Public Policy, Public Health, truly from across campus. And we will send, if you haven't seen it yet, it's been in our newsletter. Um, we have all the, the topics are gonna be really wide ranging, everything from shall we do our groceries online to, um, the role of university of dining and climate change, to rematriating seeds, to trees and urban agriculture, to uh, solar farms. So there's just going to be a huge range of talks. It's going to be fun, fast paced, and you'll get, you know, we've been hearing from people across the country about their various food systems work, and this is going to give you more of a insights about what's going on on our campus. So Tune in next week. It should be a fun time.